Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for attending the Diversifying in the, in the Fashion Industry panel. So we've got some amazing people on the panel with us that we're going to talk about um, the topics and any questions at the end, we'll speak about it. I'm Radha Singh. I'm the Creative Director and CEO of the House of Radha. And we're going to now do a bit of an introduction with each member. This one. Uh, hi, guys. Um, I'm Daniel Peters. I'm the founder of the Fashion Minority Report, which is a diversity, equity and inclusion consultancy working with the fashion industry and the creative sector to create um, meaningful and purposeful change. Hi, everyone. I am Tiffany Fraser. I am the DE and I specialist at Farfetch. Um, Farfetch is a luxury online fashion company. Hi, my name is Laura Edwards and I'm the founder of a mentoring scheme called Mentoring Matters, which is basically a mentoring scheme support system and community for candidates from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds looking to get into the creative industries. Thank you. And can you also just give a visual description of uh, each member, please, as well, just for our online audience? I've just had my roots done, so my hair looks fresh. <laughs> Uh, I'm almost 40 and dressed like a 16 year old and uh, I am a white cisgender uh, female. Um, I am a um, black female with mahogany um, dark skin, mermaid long hair and <laughs> suede cowboy boots. How do I follow that? Um, <laughs> Um, I'm a fabulous black gay man um, and I'm six foot tall. I wear sun, uh, not sunglasses, glasses uh, and I'm wearing a, a pink cardigan right now. Thank you. And I'm, I've got dark brown hair, dark eyes and skin, <laughs> wearing a leather jacket. <laughs> so getting into our first question to the panel, how and why did you get involved in issues of EDI in fashion? Daniel, could you answer that first, please? Of course. So I've worked in the fashion industry for about 17 years at this point, um, and I was really fortunate to cut my teeth at Burberry. Um, and from that point, I've worked at the British Fashion Council, um, Selfridges, blah, blah, blah. They're all names at the end of the day. But the reality was that when I kind of sat back in May 2020 to look at what my experience has been working in the industry, thinking about Burberry out of 2000 members of staff, there were probably 30 or so black or brown people in head office. And that for me was a disparity that needed to be changed. And so I've got at this point, which I think we all have um, professional privilege, which I use as a way to pay it forward now. And by professional privilege, I mean that I've gained a certain amount of um, professionalism through knowing people in the space and building relationships and now actually how can I use that as a way to make it a better industry for people from all different walks of life and diversity pillars um, but it just felt like a natural thing that I needed to do to be fair Fashion Minority Report was supposed to be a podcast it wasn't supposed to be any of this but I'm incredibly honoured and proud to get to do what I do on a daily basis. Um, so I've also worked in the fashion industry for a long time, um, a lot like Daniel, um, I worked for the popular brands that you would have heard of um, from places like Selfridges, Jimmy Choo, net porte Harrods, etc. Um, and I landed at Farfetch and I've, before I became a DE&I specialist, I was actually um, an executive assistant, which meant that I had close proximity to the senior leaders. And as we started to move into this era where DE and I became a topic, especially after the George Floyd, Floyd incident, um, where I had great relationships with the senior leaders, I was able to help with feeding into what it is, what it's like, as especially as a black woman, what my experience was professionally um, and a lot of my other colleagues too. Um, I also used to... Um, Last year, I was the chair of the Black Employee Network. So with that, I had access to a majority of our Black employees from across the globe where they were feeding in their experiences. And again, with, with my close proximity to the senior leaders, I was able to constantly say, like, look, 
this is how people are feeling. This is what we actually need. I actually became a voice um, for the minority group. Um, so it, it ended up being a natural transition, actually, um, when they made me the DE and I specialist, because what happened with that is I didn't just I didn't just try to make changes and and feed into the black employee network. I also worked um, with the rest of our other networks, which is our Southeast Asian network, our um, far out network, which supports um, LGBTQ um, women's network. So it just ended up being like a natural transition. Thank you. So also, uh, I'm actually a women's wear designer. I've worked for brands across the kind of luxury, contemporary and consulted for high street companies uh, for about 15, 16 years. And basically, again, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd was attending protests and reflecting a lot on my experience in the industry, how few faces of colour there were in all the rooms that I was in and just how it no longer felt acceptable for me to not try and do something about that. Um, so uh, it started very casually with me. I do some visiting lecturing and had reached out to some of the unis during lockdown and said, does anybody just need an hour? It doesn't have to be reflection on your portfolio or critiquing, but if you just need a chat because you can't do graduate fashion week or you, you can't even go to the pub with your friends to finish up, then sign up and we can just do that and see if it helps. And about four days worth of people signed up for back to back sessions. They left feeling a bit more confident and a bit more like relaxed. And it was no skin off my nose. I was furloughed uh, from work. So it was totally I enjoyed it and then started to think, seen as that was so effective, is there possibly a way we can apply this to try and uh, make some difference with the disparities in the industry? Uh, and again, it was never supposed to be. Uh, like my full-time job, uh, which it, it now is, uh, my unpaid full-time job, but it's um, definitely been the best thing. Mentoring Matters has like 170 candidates uh, across the world in 17 different countries, and it's like the biggest family and community and support network, and I can see a face in the audience that brings me a lot of joy. Um, so, you know, it, for me, it's as soon as I could see the effect it was having, uh, people getting into paid opportunities through the scheme or people just feeling more confident and assured and having a soundboard during lockdown, as soon as I could see how much difference that was making, I felt like I had to keep it going for as long as I could. And I didn't necessarily, if you told me then, this is where you'd be now and these are the challenges, I probably would have said, I'm not the best person for this job. Um, but because it's just been a case of learning and putting one step in front of the other and just trying to do the best that I can, um, uh, that's basically been how it's evolved quite naturally. Um, so, yeah, that's where we are. No, oh, thank you so much. And for my own experiences, being more when I've kind of developed my own brand, which is fashion, art and music, and kind of really, you know, working with artists, being on runways, you know, in different countries, and just kind of feeling that, you know, inequality, you know, as a designer even, and in the kind of professional networks, going to events, and feeling a bit isolated, you know, entering rooms, how do I, you know, act and talk where they'll think, you know, yes, yeah, she's got a, a brown face, but is she serious of what she's doing? And, you know, that's when I was kind of really feeling that this, I shouldn't feel like this. This is not normal. I should just be enjoying and embracing my creativity and being in industry. But why do I feel like this? And it was just then when I started speaking to other professionals and then them saying that, well, I'm from an African background and I feel the same way as you where, you know, I'm in a senior position, but I think twice before I give a reaction, you know, when I speak to others that are in the room. And I, it was just when I kind of really openly spoke to them and said, but why is that? It's just because the way people might see me or, you know, they might not take me seriously or it's just that, you know, the way it is. And I just thought it shouldn't be like this. So that's when I thought, well, you know, if I could use my platform or my brand as kind of supporting these issues and then working across into the learning sector with students, again, that voice that I kept hearing of the young generation, of the difficulties they're having in the classrooms, not having them role models, not having teachers that really understood them because 
again not coming from some a similar background or even just that understanding again made me more aware thinking that we have to get moving with this and making changes for the better um but yeah that was really what made me do what i'm doing today and thank you so our next question is, tell us about the work your organisation or platform does. And I'll go to Laura for that first, please. <laughs> so we work across like a variety of ways. Uh, first stop is like mentoring in which you get paired with people in the industry. So we've had really great people get involved. So like Alistair McKim, Cindy Harvey, Hannah Khalifa, um, you know, just a really great um, cross-section of people from all areas. We have people in film, we have people who are writers, we have Alice Casely Hayford, you know, we have like all of these guys who then basically give their time over a period of about six months. So that's the first step is you get this time with somebody one-on-one -on -one to ask them questions, to just have that space, have a bit of a cheerleader for you. And then what we wanted to make sure was that at the end of that process, it wasn't just that that person was out there on their own then. So I was trying to figure out what we could do. So we basically created a network and I wanted it to feel like much more of a community. So we have like a message hub where if there's job opportunities, paid placements, grants, uh, exhibitions, I can drop that into the message hub. Everybody can apply for it. If we get tickets for freeze or Molly Goddard fashion shows, we can drop that in the hub and the guys get to go. Um, last night we had an amazing event with Mulberry, who are our sponsors, where it was like a QA, and a and then we had drinks and got to hang out in three dimensions, which was amazing. Um, so it, you also have that support network, which also means there's lots of peer relationships being made, which gives the guys their own agency. They can ask each other questions, lift each other up. And as they're starting to get their foot in the door, they're seeing each other in those rooms and they're being like, hey, we know each other. And so these relationships are being formed, which is really beautiful. We have like people having coffee in New Zealand. We have people shooting together in India and we have a lot of the UK based guys as well. And then we do workshops. So it can be like a guest session where Alice Casely Hayford might come and talk to the guys, uh, give them access to these people with these brilliant brains for an hour. Uh, to pick their brains uh, and we also do more things like how to nail an interview you know really simple skill based things like that uh, I feel like there's something else that we do as well paid placements job opportunities we only work with businesses that do paid opportunities because obviously along with the the racial divide there's the economic situation that we need to take into account as well my generation did a lot of working for nothing and uh, that immediately takes a lot of people out of the room that can't be there so we're just working on that trying to support as best we can trying to connect people out of that 170 uh, mentees 25 percent have already had paid work through the scheme which is something that i'm so proud of because we've worked really hard on it and actually as soon as people have that network which previously was only open to a very small majority of people whose friends mum knew somebody who knew somebody now it's a much broader network and you can see people like getting in there and, and really like flying as they should be. Um, so, yeah, I think that is everything that we do. Thank you. Tiff, would you like to go next, please? <clears throat> yeah, so I would say I would have to break it down into three categories. So um, the first is recruitment. So in regards to making sure that we're getting diverse talent in the door. Um, so some of the things that we've done is we've been working with a lot of great partnerships, um, Daniel, Daniel's um, partnership, Fashion Minority being one of them. Um, and we really, before, before we um, you know, chose the partnerships that we were gonna work with, we really looked at what it is that we're trying to do as a business when it came to diversifying um, our platform. And one of the, the issues that we, looked, that we identified that was at the top of the list was actually um, race when it came to black representation. So we purposely made sure that we were working with um, partnerships that really focused on this. So when it came to certain jobs and stuff being out there, we're working with these partnerships that can publicize the jobs where they have the network of you, you know young blank black future talent that are, um, you know, will be looking at their website and stuff to apply through. Um, also doing talks, hosting them, you know, um, within our office, um, giving them sort of like an insight into what it's like in this world. Because obviously, if you come from a certain background, you may not be exposed to different jobs and stuff in the fashion industry. The other, um, the other part of the pie, I would say, is 
um, internally. So what are we doing for our internal staff um, within the business? Um, and a few of those things are looking at making sure that everybody is paid fairly across the board, making sure that um, black talent who have been in the business for over two years are sitting down with our CFO and our, chief, our CFO and our chief of people talking about their experience, what it is they want to do, how that how they can help, making sure we have got networks such as the Black Employee Network amongst nine others, um, other networks too, where we all all networks actually have an executive sponsor. So this sponsor will be somebody that has a lot of knowledge and a lot of a lot of um, you know influence within the business that can help their community that they're sponsoring to achieve what it is that they're trying to achieve. Also, it's given a voice to the people within those communities as well. As said, I was one of them. Um, and being open-minded, so some of the, the ideas that I came up with that did really help was we didn't have any Black representation at leadership. And I was like, you know, what? well, what we can do is actually create a panel called Elevate, where we use the far-fetched name and our context, our co um, contact, sorry, to actually bring in, um, you know, diverse talent to come and speak to our community not just the black employees but the business as a whole about what it was like for their for their journey what it's still currently like and what it is that we can be doing to improve and we've had some phenomenal people join we've had Marvin Harrison from Dope Black Dads I'm sure a lot of you guys know him we've had Olivia Rustang I hope I said that right because I know where I am <laughs> um, from Barmain join and um, we've also got Edwin Edinfield from Vogue actually joining us next week on the same platform to come and speak to the community and speak to the business and that's just one of the one of the amazing things that have come out of you know just us going to senior ta talent and leaders and saying this is what we want you know how can you help 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 make it happen um, and I would say um, lastly is the e-commerce side because obviously we are online so we have been reviewing when it comes to our diverse boutiques you know how many black and boutiques are we working with you know um how many how many of them are actually on the front page how many of them are we featuring how many of you know how many black designers are we pushing what black designers can we be pushing again i'm only really focusing on the um the black background at the moment because we had to look at what is the main problem and how can we help elevate this so i would say those are a couple of things that we're working on thank you daniel you want me to speak <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so at Fashion Minority Report, we've got kind of four main pillars, not to outdo your three. Um, but, uh, you know, in line with Mentoring Matters, we run a mentoring program that lasts for 16 weeks and you're paired with an industry professional from one of our partner brands. Um, for the cohort, we've just closed out. Farfetch was a partner, Fred Perry, uh, Dunhill, Pooge Group and ASOS. And, you know, at the end of the program, our mentees then get the opportunity to pay f apply for a paid internship, which is paid a London living wage at one of those brands. And, you know, we've now got three young black women at ASOS. Um, we've got an Indian woman at Pooj. We've got uh, one more person at Dunhill. And then we've got two uh, going into Fred Perry. And f that for me is a really amazing process that brings it full circle because it's yes for the mentees but it's also for the mentors because they get something from it as well um and you know we, we have three cohorts in we also now run speed mentoring off the back of that um where you get to come in for an evening um with like-minded peers you get paired with um two mentors for the evening and you get to talk about some of the things that you're perhaps struggling with um and then our other pillars, we work with um, brands such as Bell Staff and Pooj, and we uh, do surveys, so an audit of the business to understand how the employees who work there feel about the culture. Because for me, before you can start to bring new people in, you need to set the right standard for the culture that you've got. So from that, we then build out a strategy, you know, for our client Pooj, you know, and with Pooj, they own a majority share of Charlotte Tilbury and Byredo, and they also own uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier and brands like that. And it's not because it's a name dropping exercise, but it's great that actually our young people are beginning to get more access to these brands. Um, but then, you know, with Pooj in particular, we've then just written their diversity and inclusion manifesto, which is going to go out across their UK business um, with clients like Farfetch. We're now globally rolling out um, a workshop on allyship, which is a two hour workshop. 
um, and it's for all members of the business in Portugal, Asia, America, you know, the UK to attend. And we've had such a great response to it. Um, and it's a space for people to come in and be vulnerable. We do that with other clients and we're building new workshops around supporting the retail teams because actually they end up having that front-facing conversation sometimes with the general public that can be quite difficult. And actually it's equipping all members of staff, no matter what their level of seniority, with the right tools to be able to combat um, issues of discrimination or marginalization. Um, outside of that, our fourth pillar is our learning and career development hub. So in May of this year, I feel like I can't remember what I do anymore. <laughs> I can. Um, in May of this year, you know, I launched a learning and development platform because I see that there's really this big space for 14 to 30 year olds to be better equipped with knowledge about the industry. We so often talk about being a designer, a stylist, a photographer, a model or being Edward Enningful. No shade because I think he's great. But those are the kind of only five roles that we really talk about. We don't talk about being a pattern cutter or being a fabric and trims buyer or being you know, a project manager or the finance officer or the HR, whatever. And for me, it's now that we do interviews and articles with different professionals in the industry. Um, we also have a career A to Z that we're building out. We've just run a summer school for 14 to 17 year olds, which was really great. And within all of this, we've got partners again, like ASOS and Farfetch, who are supporting us and All Saints. And it's really incredible to be speaking to a broad intersection of people, um, you know, outside of ethnicity, we're looking at gender, disability or ability, um, you know, for me coming from a single parent working class family in Peckham, it speaks true to my values and my background and, and how I can try to elevate people. And on that note, I'll shut up. Thank you so much. Really inspirational um, organisations and platforms. For myself, as the House of Raja, mine's <laughs> again broken down into a few sections as well, but I'm a designer, so I design couture, menswear, women's wear. My collections have been in London, Fashion Week, Paris, international events. Um, I work in the house and techno scene as well with DJs and producers and artists. I open doors to them, creating opportunities. I collaborate on their events and just really um, champion talent from multicultural backgrounds because, again, there's just such a lack of that in our creative industry and fashion. Um, I also have a, an award-winning uh, learning platform as well, and very similar to my other colleagues as well, where mentoring, doing live industry projects, um, placements as well, which are remote, or then students that have to worry about costs and traveling, they don't have to, they literally work from wherever they're from, whether they're at university or they're working at home, they can do that. But just accessing, having that accessibility, being, you know, mentored or working with industry, you know, myself as an industry senior and just kind of being inspired that really, if I can do it, you can as well. And next year, we're bringing out the Creative Industries Masterclass program that is going to be basically bringing together globally industry leaders from fashion, music, art, theatre. And again, you know, covering that multicultural, you know, influence and support for your students who are studying their further education or higher education. And again, just to give hope and support, you know, because end of the day, without people like us, you, you just wouldn't have that basically, but thank you so much for your answers. So the next question is, what do you think the fashion industry and education needs to do more in terms of building more diversity in fashion? I'll come to Daniel, please. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it's about access ultimately. Yeah. What is the access that we're providing to people and what is the educational path that we're taking people on because it goes again back to what I was saying that we don't often talk about the breadth of roles in the industry but again I think it goes back to how are we talking to the parents of you know underrepresented children because typically you know especially if you're coming from an ethnic minority background you're told by your parents and often your teachers that you can't enter into this space because it's not built for you every space is built for me like that's the reality in it and, and I like to see it as the same for everybody else but I also understand that I have a certain amount of privilege because of the way that I speak and my name and all of that other BS but 
the reality is it's how do we work collectively to create more opportunities to make sure that there's a deeper understanding of what's available but also not just looking at london as being the epicenter of fashion it's incredible don't get me wrong but what about the people in glasgow or scotland and liverpool and birmingham and brighton or yorkshire you know obviously i like you know (laughs) who said somebody said newcastle like you know everywhere but like this is the problem like we, we don't open up the conversation enough and we're strongly in- encouraging people to come to London where actually they can't always afford to be here because of the cost of living, quasi quasang by. Um, but, like, literally the shortest, like, job period ever. But, like, too long, to be fair. But I think it's, like, how do we work together as a, as a, as a collective, as an industry? And for me, like, with our mentoring programme, we bring together say four or five brands and then we work with as many different universities to kind of spread that message about what it is that we're doing but I think there needs to be a much more connected approach to how we really deliver in, on this um, because often it's so it's, it can be sporadic it can be spread out and it's just it looks incredibly disjointed yeah. you know thank you um I would say um equity um, everybody's road is different um, and we need to look at um, building blocks to make sure that where some people are lacking in areas um, that may not be their, you know, their fault, more time it isn't, um, how we can help them with those building blocks to get where they need to be. So I know that within um, Farfetch at the moment we're starting to look at bespoke programs depending on the community and what is needed because we can we can understand that you know everybody's journey is different and unfortunately sometimes you are impaired by the way you know you look you speak the contacts that you have your disability your religion etc so definitely um, looking at equity and how are we making sure that the road it might not it might not be um you know the, the same the same way but making sure that it's the same destination for everybody to make sure that we're getting more equal opportunities and I would say secondly like just keeping it real and leaning in you just have to lean in sometimes things don't feel right sometimes we don't have the data but what we all do have is a heart and a gut and just connecting the two and saying you know what you might not speak a certain way come from a certain background gone to a certain university but I work with you or I know you or you're sitting in front of me in the interview and my heart just takes you because I can see you've got what it is and just taking a chance you know we've got probation periods if they don't work out after three months you know whatever but actually really just leaning into people and giving them an opportunity and a chance thank you Uh, i completely agree with both of what the guys were saying i think access is really important i'm from the north where i didn't really think that fashion was even an actual like plausible career and I just couldn't understand how I would get down to London in the first place so I always say to the guys when they're anxious about where they're at like I graduated I went back home I worked in a restaurant uh, for like nine months before I could afford to move to London where I then got unpaid internships which would then deplete all my funding and I'd have to go and work on a shop floor or get a job then go back and work for free then go back and so I felt like I could never move on and I could never see the end point and I'd just be on the shop floor forever and I could see people who could outlast me in the internships because they had the money and the finances to just be like I'll be here I'll do it all and I couldn't make that happen so it felt tough enough And I'm a white person who can see myself reflected in every single job in that office. So there's a confidence that comes with that, that I at least think, well, I want to be here, so I'm going to have to do whatever it takes, you know. And I think there's a lot of the access and demystifying the industry and sort of reaching out to people that are in different areas. So it's not so London centric, but also the equity issue. It's not really good enough to just be trying to put people in the entry level positions. You need people in the leadership roles. Even from, this is what I don't understand, even from a purely business sense, if you're a business brain, the more people you authentically reach and can speak to as a brand, the bigger your audience, surely the higher your profit. So even if you don't care about it, I mean, then you should be in prison. But like, you know, even if you don't care, uh, surely from that point of view, it makes sense for you to expand your business and get all the voices in the room from different economic backgrounds, different like ability levels, women, men, you know, uh, non-binary people, like 
the more people you have in the room, the better the conversation is and the more chance you've got of actually making effective change. And people can sniff it out when you're not being authentic, when you're saying something, but you don't really mean it and you don't care about it. People can tell it a mile off. So I think a lot of businesses say to me, oh, but I only get the same people, like the same blonde haired white girls from posh backgrounds um, coming for the roles. So then at that point, I'm like, well, then at this point, we need to be accountable. What is it about us and our business that isn't inviting for people from different backgrounds? How do we adjust that? It's an uncomfortable conversation to have and to like look at yourself sometimes and be like, right, OK. And then I do believe if you need to make targets, make targets, do whatever it takes, because whatever we've been doing has not been good enough. And it's embarrassing at this point. So I think, you know, pushing people, having uncomfortable conversations, uh, it's got to be done and the outcome will hopefully be like even just standing in the room last night with the guys from our scheme it is the future is in that room so i'm like don't even bother talking to me talk to them because they you're all my bosses in like a few years time you know um so yeah i think it's about really challenging everybody and yourself and having the right intention uh and using your privilege to try and make uh, any difference that you can, basically. Thank you so much. I think those are really important um, points that you've all made and all that I can really relate to, and I'm sure the audience can too. And something that I can really relate to, Daniel, is, you know, when I started the House of Rada, I was a single parent, a little four-year-old, just graduated, and thinking, how can I move my little family as me and my son down to London. Fashion is what I've studied and design, jobs, there's nothing in the North Yorkshire, northeast where I'm based. What do I do? And that's when I just thought, well, the only way to get my work out and creativity is create a platform, but don't just do it for myself. Try and do it where others can also share it. And, you know, share their you know beauty how they see it whether it's an art music you know whatever it is do it together because as a collective voice i feel that's stronger and you can just create beyond what you expect um but i really work hard to champion you know outside of the you know london i mean london means a lot to me in the sense of the work that i do here but being based up in the north area it's important that you know something happens there too so i do work with institutions there i do help them cross over that bridge which they find very difficult to do their students are really scared in you know leaving that kind of comfort zone and seeing if there's doors open for them here and we're all everyone here is even fighting for them opportunities so how can they find their way through it but you know with again support and what i do with my brand i'm hoping that that can ease as time goes on but again it's just things that you know are very important that we need to really stay focused on but thank you so much so that's the kind of last of our questions. And now it's just over to our audience in person and online. So does anyone have any questions for our panel, please? <laughs> Is there anything online? Okay. Okay, we've got a question. Oh, it's quite American chat show. I oh, know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was. I would like to hear what um, your account experiences of. Um, um, it seems to me, listening to you, that there is so much happening that you're doing at sort of ground level, sort of grassroots movements, and that is very vibrant. At what point do you think there still is, you know, this kind of British Fashion Council and other powerful unless they're not, um, institution that also have to do more than just wait for the grassroots movements or, or the people to do all the, all, all the work that is, is being done. So do you feel, my question would be, there might be still a, a, a discrepancy between a fairly comfortable uh, British structure there or system that does not allow and support uh, uh, designers from minorities and is the dialogue happening or um so i i do do some work with the british fashion council um you know we could move quicker 
in general. Um, but I think it's also not just a UK issue. It's a global issue when we look at the fashion industry. Um, I think that the UK fashion industry has perhaps advanced a little bit quicker than some other spaces. But for me, it also comes back quite centrally to government. And actually, what is the government putting in place? You know, if you're a company of 250 people or more, you have to talk about, you know, gender pay gap. But actually, we don't have anything in place for that in terms of quantifying ethnic minority. Um, so actually, I think that there's a lot that can be done there to mandate change. And, you know, I think not because I do work with the, with the BFC, but they're a small organization who are a charity in theory, and, and they don't write the rules and they can't enforce for a company or business or brand to do something. They can spearhead change as much as any of us can. Because for me, it's a case of the fact that we're all change makers. And for that 1% of change that we all make, actually it, it feeds into the bigger picture. But I think there are always barriers and there will probably always continue to be barriers. But I think that with us coming together more collectively, we're seeing that change happen. You know, we can we can only look at what happened in Rana Plaza back in 2013, but we're still having to have the conversations about sustainability even more fiercely than we did before. So actually, it goes to say that, again, without having that mandated change, we're not able to move the marker as quickly as we'd like to. Um, I think it's great that there are different businesses of different scales getting behind schemes um, and initiatives such as what we're doing and, and, you know, working with each other in different ways. But again, I think it's also a mentality shift from the workers. And that's for me, like, why we go in and we talk about allyship in terms of workshops, because actually it brings about the understanding that actually it's not just the responsibility of minority groups to create the change. It's really about how we all effectively feed into that conversation, because if not, it stays stagnant and it doesn't move anywhere in any shape towards where it should be. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. I actually think that transparency should be the key. So in the same way we hold people to accountability, whether it's coming through or not with sustainability, what does your board look like? Yeah. What does your business look like? You know, why shouldn't we know that? And if that creates pressure and discomfort, then that's a conversation you need to be having. I feel like it's been so long of us saying, oh, this really needs to change, but has it really changed enough? Like, yes, like we're doing our best, but why should we have to wait for that? And, you know, the people at the top do need to be from, uh, all kinds of different backgrounds. So I think as individuals, we can challenge the companies that we're within and, and say, what about this? And we can challenge people that we talk to and we can try and just spread it that way as well. But yeah, I feel like put it on your website. I wanna know who works there and how long they've worked there and what they do there and how many people they have under them. You know, I've, make people feel uncomfortable. If that's what it takes to cause change, like everybody else has felt uncomfortable with not having a place at the table. So. I'm kind of up for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go. And just off of that as well, I think it's also about how we're surveying the industry, not just with one company, but also how we're looking at the industry as a whole to see what the makeup is of the industry. Um, you know, who is at a creative dialect, creative directorship position? You know, it's great to see the Maximilian is now at Farragamo, but we need more of that. And also, it's not just about black talent being in those creative directorship positions. Where is the Indian talent? Where is the Asian, you know, talent? So many different people, people's voices need to be contributed to the, you know, to what we're discussing here. And it's just to your point around transparency, there's been an, a very distinct lack of it. And, you know, not that I need another bloody job to do, but... You know, we're we're going to be putting out a new a, a kind of white paper report, but it's going to be a newspaper in February during London Fashion Week, and we're hoping to collate some industry data from how um, employees feel that the dials moved forward, but also looking at consumers how they feel that the dials move because actually we're always trying to sell to consumers and sell them a dream, but again for the from the authenticity point, are we truly understanding how they feel about the changes that we're making? And that's what I wanted to add. Thank you all for your amazing talk. Um, I spoke to a couple of people in this room, including you, um, for an investigation I did last year. And part of that research came, like what came about was that 
in addition to governments, organizations, British Russian Council, Art Council, like all these people are incredibly important and everyone can contribute to the change. But something that was also really interesting is I don't feel like personally enough emphasis or talk is being done about like the primary schools and the secondary schools. You could be a privileged person who went to private school and still be, you know, not in this industry because you were focusing on academic subjects or you might have never had opportunity to that. So I respect what you are all doing and I would love to know if, you know, particularly like Farfetch in other department stores and things like that, is working with the primary or I would say like secondary schools because I know there's a lot of regulation issues in that, but is that something that you would consider doing because I feel like systemically you need to start from there to then, you know, get that change. You know, what's really interesting, um, and Daniel will probably be able to agree with this, is um, whenever a company starts out with a diversity movement, the first place they, they look at is future talent, actually. And one of the first things they do look at is mentorship programs, um, how we can talk to more students, how we can get people, kids from different backgrounds to understand the makeup of an organization and the different roles that there are, um, how they can apply themselves for, for this, this new way of working. Um, so I would say that, you know, I can't, I can't speak for every company, but definitely Farfetch, that is something that was one of the first things at the gate that they looked at was future talent. You know, are we making, are we advertising our jobs at different places for, you know, a different demographic of, of a student um, going down to conferences um, that are <clears throat> feeding in from university students that want to, you know, graduate and work in these kind of organisations. So, I would say that there's quite a lot being done with future um, talent. <clears throat> and sometimes I actually think we, do, we, we, we can never do too much with future talent, but sometimes I feel like that sometimes gets, it gets stuck there and we don't concentrate on the talent that's already in the business, actually, because it's so easy to, to focus on future talent and, you know, what it is that they need to learn and what needs to be applied and to make sure that they have access. That I think sometimes, actually, we forget about the talent that's in the organisations that might be going through microaggressions that don't have equity actually applied. But um, to your question, yes, that is something that 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 we are focusing on. Um, I would love to. If I had the resources, I would absolutely love to speak to schools. I think it's really important just to demystify the industry, tell people about all the roles of jobs, because people think, oh, the arts or creative, maybe your teachers aren't encouraging you in that direction or your parents aren't. But actually, along with the designers, much like uh, Daniel was saying about the pattern cutters and things like that, which is something we try and do as well is sort of say okay well everybody in there is a logistical cog in that machine actually um and without them none of it exists either so if your skills are efficiency and logistical or communications that's still something we can help you to channel in this way um and one of the guys from mulberry that did their talk last night he's from the northeast of england he dropped out of school he didn't know what he wanted to do he worked in retail and he made his way to the top of Mulberry and he's now like, you know, absolutely smashing it. And it was so inspiring, I thought, to hear him talk about that journey last night, because you do think that everybody's had an easy way. But actually, people have navigated in different ways. And I think people get so disheartened by what they feel they're not doing well enough or they can't see themselves doing it. But actually, it's about focusing on your skill sets and then just keeping going and trying to sort of slot yourself in whatever way that you can. Or pivoting, you know, if something's not working for you, even when you're further down the line in your job, pivot and change and see if you can do it that way. I've forgotten what the question was now. I've just gone off on a complete <laughs> tab job. I'm going to pass it back to you. Sorry. <laughs> um, for me, secondary schools are the sweet spot, um, without sounding like a weirdo. Um, <laughs> just want to put it out there. But secondary schools are the sweet spot because actually, I remember, and this is a story about me, folks, so but get ready for it. But like I went to the Brit School for Performing Arts when I turned 14. But that was a conscious decision that I made because actually I had some insight into what I wanted to do, which was to be a singer. And, you know, I had to in, well, not really negotiate with my mother, but to say I was going to the Brit School. So for me, it's really at that point when you're making decisions about your future that's where the conversation needs to happen and you know that that's why we did our we ran our summer school for 14 to 17 year olds with the fashion resell academy for two weeks and we had two young girls get on a train who were 17 from liverpool at 5 a.m to come down somebody from birmingham somebody from leeds you know and we had 
20 students across two co uh, across two weeks and Farfetch were involved with that. And what we did is we brought in industry experts um, for hands-on workshops. So we did one about marketing, we did one about partnerships, we did one about visual merchandising, and we did one about fashion design, and there was another one, but I can't remember. Um, but for me, it was making sure that it was kind of fact-based and led by an in industry professional who succeeded, but also having a broad spectrum of people who don't look the same come in and do it but then also setting a challenge as part of that workshop you know um the british fashion council is involved in the saturday school saturday club 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 um and then on top of that i know that there's a great deal of work that they're pushing now um regionally to really connect with um secondary school students because people are kind of calling out for the information but you know with our summer school for instance when we did the marketing class at the end of it one of the young girls said oh i didn't know that marketing was creative that for me is the problem that actually we're not having deep enough conversations with a broader spectrum of of, of people and so going into secondary schools and you know actually again with farfetch we're starting to do what we're calling intro to industry um where we're going to be going into where well, we're going to be bringing different secondary schools to a head office of a different fashion brand running a kind of two hour session um so we should talk um but we'll be bringing kind of uh year 10s i think it is or year 12s or something um into these places of work we'll be again doing a presentation and then setting them a challenge to go away and actually work on that and then you know there's an incentive at the end that you can get a voucher for like the people who put you know the three people who produce um the most exciting work i'm careful or conscious not to call it the best work but ultimately it's that is the space that we need to penetrate because that's where we can make the real change and difference and it's not always about saying to people you need to go to university and i'm sure bernie will appreciate that in the audience but it's not <laughs> all right they're rock star um but it's not always about pushing you know young people to go to university i started at burberry at 19 because I knew that I wanted to get into the industry. And so, you know, I was on the shop floor of Selfridges doing four days a week when I was 18. And then I went to the VM team and said, do you know what, I've got an extra day. For, I'm happy to work for free and to learn from you. And then they put me forward three months later for a role at Burberry. So for me, I knew that university wasn't the path, but it's like we need to talk about the different pathways um, and, 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 and help people as best as possible to succeed and to thrive, but also just really nurture them. Um, and myself, I'm actually going to be get, getting involved with the kind of secondary school side of it. And it kind of started with my son, to be honest, who was just talking about what I do as a creative, as a designer to his teacher. And she just said, would your mum come in and uh, do a little inspirational talk with our kids? Because it would really give them an insight of the different areas that are available to them. So I think grassroots is going to be so key now than just FE and HE. Because if we get them at that young age and offer them the kind of options of different routes like Danielle, Tiff and, you know, Laura has talked about, they can then start making their decisions a bit more earlier in a way of, well, actually, I might want to be an entrepreneur and set up a business than actually going through the academia route. I myself did vocational qualifications and then went and did my undergraduate but as a mature student. So again, I used a different method of learning, development and experience as well. So thank you for that question. Appreciate that. Is there any more? We have a question from online. Oh, brilliant. Um, thank you. How can they best contact you in the future if they want to talk further uh, through social media, email or? Uh, LinkedIn. Starters. Um, also, my email address is info at fashionminorityreport.com. Happy to receive any emails and have a chat. I think what we'll do is all our contact details, we all have social media, LinkedIn profiles, we will have them with CSM that can then distribute them to anyone that's interested. Thank you. Sorry, more questions? Um, yeah, this is definitely a question for all of you. I think it's amazing what everyone's doing and I'm obviously like on the receiving end, so I'm very appreciative, but I think also a stumbling block I'm coming across now as a final year student here doing fashion journalism, where a lot of it is like 
where's the facts where's the statistics it's that unfortunately a lot of like the quantitative data around like black people in industries always kind of comes back to like black people and or ethnic minorities and their relation to the youth, like the justice system or the youth justice system. So I guess my question is kind of what other ways or like where can we begin to like look at quantifying data around us as minorities in this creative space that finds a way to like overpower the negative kind of statistics that, are, that we see like all the time in the news? Because obviously like we are my mi we're minorities but we're also we have like majority impacts I feel so it's kind of like how can we find a way to like make sure that it's not just like these talks or like you know like what's being said or what's being written but also like the like numbers that are matching what's being said and people are seeing those as well it's like I mean I was just going to say, it sounds like that's kind of what Daniel is already working to do as well, is to sort of get it down on paper and, you know, be able to show that. And it will take a long time. I mean, it's so it's like anything that doesn't concern white men, the data is like lacking. Uh, but yeah, I don't have the answer. I just wanted to say that I feel like that's the work you're doing, which is important work. Um, for sure. So. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, because I, that's the thing for me. There isn't enough transparent, authentic data. And that's why I want to make a start as best as possible. Also, the problem is, though, a lot of us have survey questionnaire fatigue. Um, so not everybody always wants to fill one in. So it's making sure that in a really succinct way that you can capture the mood of what's happening in industry. But again, it's not just from an internal perspective. It's also got to be from an outside perspective, looking inwards. You know, who who are the brands that, that, that we feel are producing authentic marketing campaigns? You know, but then also there's looking at things like the 50-50 project, which is something that the BBC run, um, and they're collecting data with, say, the British Fashion Council at the end of um, each show to see who was there um, in terms of behind the scenes. But we can obviously get deeper with it. We need to, because actually, unless we understand the disparity um, and the breadth of who works where, we're not going to be able to like kind of quantify it in the right way and look at how we can use that to strategize how we move forward. So for me, it's ultimately we've got to start somewhere. I'm not saying like what I'm doing and who I am is the be and end all at all. But for me, it's a starting point because it's something I'm passionate about. And actually, it's then how can we galvanize something like that and actually turn it into something that, again, can then be taken into, say, government, you know, as a fact check or a fact based thing. I mean, I was just going to like, I think Daniel basically said it towards the end, but and I think he mentioned it earlier on as well, where I was going to say that it is hard to, to collate data when you know, everybody is overstimulated as it is. Um, but I think it will have to be one of those things where you have to make it compulsory. So maybe you have to look at government changes that bring in, bring in, in like, you know, certain rules and regulations to make sure that the delay are, you know, it, it isn't something that can actually be delayed anymore. Hi, um, thanks everyone. It's been really interesting. I just wanted to ask maybe for your thoughts on resilience. And I don't know if in your kind of industry context, this is language you use, but probably in your mentoring and that kind of side of it, possibly more so. Because I think in academia, we seem a bit obsessed with it. Um, and actually, I think we don't spend enough time acknowledging that resilience is actually a massive privilege because how do you build resilience you take risk and who can't take risks people without resilience so I think like this obsession with trying to instill that in our students and in young people and in future creatives who want to enter the creative in industries is really problematic but then I have this conflict of okay if I don't do this and instill this in my students am I ill-equipping them for a kind of broken industry in many ways so I constantly have this battle with myself of how do I do the right thing in I don't know in that world in addressing that and I just wondered if any of you have any thoughts on that I think it's a great thing that you are um 
installing this into your students and that's a that's a personal um answer because um i went to lcc and i went i went in wanting to do magazine publishing knew, knew nothing about it all i knew is that um i wanted to be an editor of a fashion magazine because i wanted to see more girls that looked like me actually so i thought oh, i'm just going to be i'm going to go and be an editor and i'm going to make my own magazine and i remember on my first day my lecturer said majority of you in here will have to work harder and she said the reason for that is you'll be up against a lot of pi girls and we were like what's a pi girl and they were like she was like private income and I was like, right. And I thought, I wish they said this before I signed up. This is literally my first day I'm sitting here. I was like, this is, that's, that's a bit unfair. And um, that was an interesting journey for me because I, I don't come from a published background actually. And um, I'm first generation born here. I'm the first person in my household to go to university. So I had to learn, you know, the, un, the unwritten codes um, on the spot. And, um, and and obviously on top of that, I'm a black woman. So be, being in that in that course, being on that course and in that classroom, I realized that you had your really introverted people, your extroverted people. You, then you had the PI income girls that were in the class, the ones that were, you know, came from private, um, uh, you know, um, backgrounds where they could afford this and that, and they were friends with designers. So when we had to make our own front covers, they were coming in with these these projects, and I was like, wow, this looks like a real magazine. And you know, I was just asking my friend with like a sheet and like a a, a wall, like to, to 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 put my my things together. But one thing that always stuck out was every time we were in like a lecture or, or whatever and we were having an interactive session my lecturer would always ask me like what do you think what what do you think and I remember saying to her one time why don't you ask somebody else because you're always coming to me but I've kind of been told that I'm going to fail because I don't have the tools in comparison to, re to the rest of these pe the, the rest of the people in here and I remember she asked me to stay behind after that and I thought oh, I spoke my mind and now I have to stay behind but I was like okay and afterwards she said what, what what's going on so I said to her I feel like I'm going to fail I've never heard of the Harvard referencing system till I till I got here you know like I feel so behind I don't have photographer friends this seems like it's going to be so difficult for me but yeah I know not to sound cocky I was like I know I'm better than half of the people in this room so this is not making any sense to me. And she said, you are better than half of the people in this room. And I want you to remember that. And I want you to keep going. And that's what got me to the end of my degree. And certain, in certain situations up to this day, it helps get me out of my bed. The world isn't perfect and it is hard. And that's, that's why we're sitting here today. So I personally think that, you know, just having those one-on-one -on -one chats, like installing resilience isn't always ugly sometimes it's a beautiful thing and that one gem and that one stone that you can give to someone it can help them forever so for me i would say continue. i think that i don't even think i can i need to add to yeah i'm like what do i say now um no i think resilience is incredibly key because actually it helps you to understand the landscape of something um, but it's also making sure that we're teaching people to take care of themselves because actually we're we're told to push ourselves so hard so that you can be at the forefront of 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 the ladder and in front of everybody else but it's just like that is incredibly true but I remember doing six weeks to bring the Burberry runway show back to London with one day off and my boss said one thing to me at the end of the show and I was just in a pile on the floor crying it was fine. They were like, they weren't ugly tears. It was all right. But like, it was a great day. But like, you know, I, I wish I'd have had more of that mentality of self-care built into the resilience. Because I think, again, we're often told, as I say, to push ourselves and to get to that next level and to be better than somebody else. But also it's it's showcasing that, you know, there can be hardships, there can be struggles, but to push beyond them. Not, I know I said don't push, but like to move beyond them, I guess, is the point, really, to say that there is there is, you know, a, a greener pasture on the other side of it. But like, don't stop because we get a no, because actually, if we, if we stop when we get no's, then where do we actually get to? So it's just I guess it's that full care package system of building somebody up to understand that at different times you could be torn down, but pick yourself back up. 
Well, that comes to um, the end of our session. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to our panels that have really given us a, an amazing insight to their industry that they are in, but also as a collective, as a voice of what we can do for the future. And thank you to all the audience that took the time to come and listen to us and online as well. Thank you. <laughs>